All right, so today we'll talk about IMRT. Now, IMRT is a huge, huge topic, and we could cover it from an overview of IMRT, we could cover it from a theoretical standpoint of IMRT, from a physics standpoint of IMRT. There's so much to talk about. I mean, this could be a whole course. So it's difficult to squeeze into one lecture, and, but I did. I put it into one lecture, and what I tried to do is I, tried, I want to give you guys an overview so you see the big picture of what IMRT and what machines are out there. And then well, I, I've, dug, I've dug a little deep in some areas, but not too deep. It's not a very technical talk. It's more of an overview talk. Uh, to get into technical, it just takes a lot It takes a lot more time, maybe another couple of lectures. So uh, I'll just give you guys an overview of IMRT today. Uh, let me um, let me start with just the show and tell. Oh, maybe I'll bring those up at, when uh, when the slide comes up. So the references I want you to know about are these three, and I have them in the background here, so I can sh pop them. Up. I can show them to you. The references are Khan. By the way, Khan really doesn't deal with IMRT very well. Uh, it's a little outdated. I, I'm not. I don't agree with the topics they chose in terms of um, talking about IMRT. Some of them are okay, but uh, I, I just didn't like that chapter. Okay, so here's here's one. Oh, this is Quantic. This isn't it. Oh, there it is. Okay, so here are the, the documents that you guys need to know about. Number one, guidance document on delivery and treatment planning and clinical implementation of IMRT. These are this is available from the APM reports page. Okay, um, and this is a guidance document for IMRT. So if you want to start a program or know a little bit about IMRT, you look at this guidance document, and uh, we'll, in my talk brings up some of these some of the topics covered in this document and this is um, this was published in 2003 next document is one where they looked at IMRT commissioning multiple institution planning and dosimetry comparisons a report from APM TG 119 so what they did is they they sent out a survey to multiple institutions and they asked uh, to submit plans and, to, and then what they did is they compared their passing rates you know the IMRT QA passing rates that you, you guys have done those, right? IMRT QAs. So they submitted their passing rates over several structures or, or several sites, rather, prostate, head, and neck, etc. So I'll talk about that in today's lecture as well. And then the other one is a general practice guideline. Now, ACR, American College of Radiology, and ASTRO, American Society for Therapeutic Radiation Oncology, practice guideline for intensity modulated radiation therapy. Now, these these two agencies. Um, are mostly radiation oncologists and medical physicists, and they put out practice guidelines. And what I would call these guidelines, they're not really like TGs. These are um, a, more of their, so they're shorter, they're a summary of TG, they're not as technical, and they're more for practice. They're basically, I would call them almost the minimum standards for a clinic. Okay, so the clinic should at least follow these recommendations. You know that TGs are not minimum standards, they're pretty complete in some cases. Okay. So these are minimum standards. This is something that you folks should know. They're really short. You should read this over. Uh, this is minimum standards. You know, it goes, it, it discusses things like responsibilities. Radi what is a ris radiation ris or oncologist responsible for? What is a QMP responsible for? Um, what are the continuing Medicaid, medical education requirements? QA, what's, what should you be doing for QA? You know, different people do different things. These are just minimum standards that, that are out there, and they're actually very helpful. If something comes to the court of law, say there's a, a lawsuit, they often they often quote these standards. Okay. Um, sometimes they'll go to TGs, but this is a little more accepted because they're, they're considered more like minimum standards. So those are the, the three documents you guys should know about. Let's go back to the slides. Okay. So IMRT strictly means, what is IMRT? Strictly means that the intensity of the radiation varies over the field, over the treatment field. Have you guys done IMRT with Theo yet in your treatment planning class? That's what we're doing this week. You doing that this week? Okay, good. So the timing's good. It seems to be that our timing's really good. I think Theo, Theo kind of finds out what I'm doing and he, uh, he does it. Or, or we're lucky, I don't know. So it means that the intensity of the radiation varies over the area of the treatment field. Um, where do we see that? Well, we saw that in wedges and compensators already, right? Um, but only accounts for external surface. So wedges and compensators only account for the curvature of the patient. Right? They don't account for what's going on inside. IMRT is universally associated with inverse treatment planning. So when you hear IMRT, 
is usually an inverse planning component to that, which means that, well, I'll talk about inverse planning in a minute. Alright, so forward versus inverse planning. So forward planning is more traditional. Forward planning is, um, it means that the fluence that you're delivering the, the radiation with is user evaluated. You're going to set up that fluence. What I mean by fluence? I mean that the, uh, the blocks are going to be shaped by you based on uh, DRRs or based on anatomy. So that by you and by the physician. Uh, the wedge is going to be selected by you. You pick a wedge, you try it out. It doesn't work, you try another wedge. Uh, so those those aspects are those are more more forward planning aspects, blocks, wedges, uh, even field and field is a forward planning aspect. And forward planning again means that you're you're being you're being proactive in how you're selecting to deliver the fluids. Field and field. Have you guys done field and field in treatment planning? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you know how that works. You deliver an open field. You evaluate the hot spots, and then you proactively block the hot spots. You shape your MLC to block the hot spot. Evaluate again, calculate the new hot spot, bring the MLCs. So you're being proactive about it. You're using your whatever you've learned and your knowledge to create a plan. Okay, so you can see how that's forward planning. Uh, a regular surface compensator is another example of forward planning. Okay, so you're using a compensator to, to modify the fact that you're not that humans are not a block, that there's some missing tissue in some areas. Inverse planning Inverse planning requires um, a little more computing power, uh, and it's based on the treatment planning system determining the fluence um, as a result of anatomical information inside the patient. Okay, so what's that anatomical information? OERs and PTV. Okay, so that's it, and your external surface. So, um, and what, what you do in inverse planning, instead of being proactive about changing the MLCs and modifying the MLCs, and uh, putting wedges and blocks, you're now um, you're now imposing certain constraints on your PTVs and your OERs. Okay. So you're not you're not really drawing any blocks, although you can draw some blocks if you want to block certain things. But what you're doing is you're telling the computer that you want the PTV to be coverage. You're, you're giving the PTV a certain coverage level. Okay. And the coverage level we've learned about volumetric dose constraints. We say that we want the PTV covered. 98% of the volume of the PTV to receive a certain amount of dose. Okay, so that's an example of a dose constraint. Same with OERs. You want the you want your rectum, for example, 50 50%. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, you want. What's I'm trying to think of a, a dose level. I think it's uh, well. There's many dose levels for the rectum, but one of them could be 50 gray to receive less than 50% of the dose. Okay, that's that's a constraint. So those are the types of constraints that you that you use in your treatment planning computer when you're going to use inverse planning. Okay, so now you're telling the computer, here's what I want, you go ahead and do it. You do the work and, and tell me what you do. And show me the exodosis. So you see the distinction? So how does all that happen? This is um uh, this is another example of forward planning. And I don't know, hey can you hit the lights down? This is another example of forward planning. Thanks. We don't do this at North Shore, but do um, you guys do electronic compensation for breasts anywhere? Yeah, we have one electronic compensator, and I'm not sure. At Lutheran, right? Yeah. yeah. Lutheran uses electronic compensation. Uh, and electronic compensation, um, ideally what you're trying to do is cover the entire breast with an even amount of dose and not get any hot spots. And field and field achieves that. This is another option for field and field electronic compensator. Now, with an electronic compensator, you place your beams manually, so you, you set up your beams, and then um, and then what the computer does is it calculates the missing tissue, and then it determines that if there's um, if there's a missing t if there's the the transmission or the thickness of the breast is, is low here, then it's going to deliver less dose there, and if the, if the separation is high here, it's going to deliver more dose there. Okay, so it calculates what the fluence should be to deliver uh, an even even um, radiation inside the breast. Okay, so it does, that's how the electronic compensator algorithm works. Now, once you look at that, you then have the ability, uh, this window opens up here, this is Eclipse obviously, this window opens up here which is a, a fluence tool. And you can look at the fluence and you might say, well, 
well, it looks like this area is too hot. I'm going to cool it down. So you, you have a little brush tool where you could cool it out before it's. And then every time you do that, you hit the calculate button up here, and it recalculates the isodoses, and then you can evaluate the isodoses on a slice by slice basis. Okay. This is called forward planning because, in a way, it's inverse because the computer's taken the external surface of the patient and it's calculated on its own what the fluids should be. But it hasn't looked at it hasn't looked at the lung and it hasn't looked at the heart and it hasn't used those internal structures to calculate its fluids. It's only, used the, it's only used the surface. And what you can see here, too, is that you can insert a heart block. And, you can, and it'll do that automatically. So it's blocking the heart as well. OK, and one, thing, one other thing to consider with, with this is that this is the, where, where it goes from yellow to red, that's the surface of the skin. If the patient breathes, imagine what happens if the patient breathes here and goes out here. Then the patients, you see all this yellow right here? All this area right here is going to get underdosed. So one consideration you need to do, and this is with any any kind of uh, forward uh, forward IMRT or inverse IMRT, you need to you need to stretch your fluence out beyond the breathing, so that even if the patient breathes, that high fluence that that, that high fluence of radiation that's trying to treat the breast is going to include the breathing motion. Okay, because this electronic compensator, it, it does have a tool to allow you to stretch that. So you have to make sure that you're you're applying that tool. It's an option, but you need to know about that. All right, one other one other thing to consider with electron compensator versus a field and field technique is that now you're using your MLCs are moving and you've got a lot of segments to create that fluence. Okay, so that fluence is created with the movement of the MLC leaves. So if the MLC leaves are moving, that's almost considered IMRT. Okay, so if you're doing IMRT, you need to do IMRT QA. So people who are using electronic compensators are forced to do IMRT QA. Okay? If you do field and field, you have to do IMRT QA. That's a big deal, especially for physics. Because breasts, I mean, we have a lot of breasts on treatment. So if every breast is an electronic compensator, we need to do IMRT QA for, for each breast. Now, what works better, electronic compensator or field and field for breasts? I would say they're comparable. I would say that it depends on the the level of talent of the dosimetrist. Okay? You can have a dosimetrist who's just perfected field and field, another one who's perfected electronic compensator, and I would doubt that there's any difference between the two. Uh, another thing to consider is that for electronic compensator, there's a lot more segments, so the MLCs will move, will, will be used a lot more than field and field. Field and field, we typically have three field and field, so there's three segments. Okay? So the MLC works a lot harder for electronic compensator. Okay, so now um, MLCs can deliver intensity patterns. How do these and how do these fluences and intensity patterns work? Uh, sorry, how do, how are they delivered and how are they created? Well, they can't be created with jaws. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't say they can't. There is this system out there that creates does MLC with jaws. But let's just say jaws are a little too primitive to create these complex fluences. So we use MLCs. And so how, how do MLCs work? As MLCs move throughout the field during the on time, they can change the distribution of dose, right? Because when they're in one spot, they're attenuating, and then they can move and then attenuate in another spot. And so that pattern, that, that, that movement, and that selective uh, attenuation can create a fluent, a fluent of dose. Now, it takes a lot of computing power, and it takes uh, a lot of smart people to come up with the, the positions of the leaves to create the fluence that you want. Uh, and now here I'll show you guys this. These motors here. Do you see these? Those are those are MLC motors. So each leaf, okay, so these are leaves. This is a leaf, a leaf, a leaf. And they're adjacent to each other. And each leaf, <laughs> and they move in this direction, this direction, and that direction. There's variant has two banks of leaves. Well, they all actually they all have two banks of leaves. And um, and as the, and how do they move? Well, back here at the back of the leaf, there's um there's a little screw that turns, and that screw goes inside the leaf. And as that screw turns, that screw doesn't move. But as that screw turns, there's a thread inside the leaf, and that leaf will move in and out. Okay. 
So how does that screw turn? Well, it turns with these motors, these very accurate motors. And this little one that you saw, this is from a high-definition MLC. Well, the high-definition MLC is a pretty new product. We were the first one in Chicago not to get one at, uh, on the, the Trilogy at Evanston. And then once, I think the true beam, some true beams come with the high-definition uh, MLC. This, and the high-definition uh, high MLC, HD, HD, 2.5 2. millimeter leaves. And that direct, the 2.5 is in this direction. It's the width of the leaf. Okay. It's in this direction. This motor right here, this other motor I showed you, this is a five millimeter leaf. The five millimeter, and both of these are varying motors. The five millimeter leaves are usually found in the central area of the 120 leaf MLC. And um, there's another motor, which is a 1cm leaf, and that looks a lot bigger than these two. And the 1cm is up here. Okay. And usually they're, I believe it's, I believe it's central 20. The central 20 centimeters of the field is, is half the CM leaves. And then the um, and then there's a 10 CM bank on here and a 10 CM bank on either side, which are one centimeter thick leaves. The um, the variant MLC has a very accurate position. They their spec is that they can they can move the leaf to within half a millimeter of where they expect it to be. Okay. Uh, this picture over here, this is a novellus, this is the head of a novellus machine. And the Novellus machine has three millimeter loops in the central portion. Okay, so each leaf is attached to an accurate motor, which can drive the leaf to a predetermined position. Thinner leaves produce more con conformal dose distributions. Studies have shown that leaves less than three millimeters do not offer further conformity due to penumbra effects. Okay, so that was actually an interesting study because you think the manufacturer should just skip. The advantage of having thinner leaves, by the way, is the thinner the leaf, the better the curvature is. Right? Because if you have thick leaves, um, if your leaves are thick and you're trying to create a shape, you're going to create a, more of a stair step isodose distribution. Right. So as your leaves get thinner, the distribution be get, becomes more round. Okay? But you get to a point where, remember the kernel, the dose spread kernel? When there's radiation, they're scattered. Okay? So they're scattered. And there's also penumbra effects at the edges of the leaves right here, at this at the edge of the leaf. So as your leaf gets thinner and thinner, these penumbra effects, you, you get to a point of diminishing returns, where your, your conformity doesn't get any better because you're now limited by the penumbra. Okay? And you can't get away from penumbra. I mean, these photons are going to scatter. Okay. So it looks, there's a paper that showed that as your leaves get to 3.3 millimeters, it doesn't offer any more conformity. Um, and most linear accelerators that have three or 2.5 millimeter leaves are stereotactic Linux. We're just looking at not there aren't too many Linux that are created uh, with three millimeter leaves for conventional 3D computing line. Once you're looking at three and two and a half millimeter leaves, then we're looking at uh, more SRS. So what, what I'm, trying, I'm trying to say that if you're using a Linux for conventional, uh, you're going to be you're going to do fine with five millimeter leaves. If you want to do SRS, then you should consider a three millimeter leaf uh, MLC. Now, there are many people who are using five millimeter leaves for SRS, and it works fine for certain lesions. As the lesion gets smaller, then that's where the three millimeter uh, leaf is, is an advantage. And smaller meaning around two cm. Once the lesion starts to get below two cm, then you start to see improvements with smaller MLCs. But you could do a lot of SRS with five millimeter leaves. Okay, tomotherapy. Um, so the tomotherapy machine, Don, you've seen one. You guys seen the tomotherapy machine? You two guys, okay. Uh, tomotherapy machine, Lutheran General Hospital, Rush has one. They're pretty much all over the place now. A good Sam has one. There's one in Joliet, at least one in Joliet. Um, there's Zion has one up here. They're in a lot of places today. And the way it works is, and it's fine because when I when I first started this field, okay, back in 92, 93, I went to visit the University of Wisconsin because they were doing, they were very progressive with gyne gynecological HDR, and we were starting to do a lot of HDRs. So we went up there and we visited their HDR practice. And when I was there, there was this guy, uh, Rock Mackey, who I met 
And uh, I talked to him and I said, hey, you're Canadian too? Yeah, great. So we talked about green card, how to get a green card, you know. And uh, so we started talking about green cards. We didn't talk about this until he said, have you heard of tomotherapy? And I said, well, tomotherapy, that sounds like tomo slices. And you're going to treat in slices. He goes, exactly right. And he was actually starting to work on this. I guess he was either, either started or had, or had some progress already done in tomotherapy. And so, but at the time when I found out about it, I had, that this was this was still a concept, or or, a, or at least in the uh, uh, prototype of it. But anyway, he put a lot of work into it, and he eventually marketed it. And it's it's an it's, a, uh, it's an incredible device. The way it works is there's a small linear accelerator. This is, this looks like a CT scanner, but it's a lot wider in this direction. There's a small linear accelerator. You can see it up here. It's faint. A small linear accelerator up in the head of the machine, and this linear accelerator rotates around the patient and directs its beam towards the patient. And as it does that, the couch moves in as well. So there's couch movement and linear accelerator movement uh, uh, simultaneously. And how does it deliver the radiation? Is it a square field? No, it's not a square field. It uses uh, what it calls a binary MLC. And now I'm looking at a beam's eye view. I'm looking down at the patient, and it rotates. Uh, the axis of rotation is in this, this direction. And it rotates, I don't know if you can picture it, it rotates this way, in and out of the screen. So the binary MLC is made up of these little metal, these little metal MLCs, metal um, segments. And these segments, it's called binary because it's not like a very MLC that is continuous and a motor moves in and can put it in any position along its travel. These either are either closed or open. That's what's called binary. And there's two sides to it. And you've got options where you can open, you can make this opening between the two. This is the opening. So this is an MLC and this is an MLC. And the gap between them is the opening. So you can make that opening. You've got choices. I believe the choices are four centimeters, two centimeters, or one centimeter. So you've got three choices. Don't quote me on that, but it's something like that. And, and the way they move, they don't kind of move in there slowly. They snap into position. And if you hear one of these things move, you've heard it. It sounds like clicking. It sounds like click, 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 because these things just they move in and out, in and out, very quickly. Now uh, you've got a whole series of these. So there's one up here. They're all they're all adjacent to each other. So as you're rotating around, you can deliver you can deliver affluence of radiation over this over this slice. So the radiation will vary over the slice, uh, and that's just for one slice. And then the patient and the patient's moving. This fluence can change, so it's continually changing depending on the position of these of these little stoppers, these little metal stoppers. So imagine how conformal you could get. You've got so much, so many parameters to play with now. Well, so many parameters, so many uh, fluences that you could deliver the patient with. So you've got a lot of options. And now it all comes down to computing power. How smart is the computer to deliver the dose that you need to deliver? So what calculates all these all these positions in the MLC leaves? And there's a computer called a cluster. And, uh, and it, last time I saw it, it was a rack about this high with, geez, I think it was 16 PCs in it. Uh, do you know how many there are these days? The technology's changed over time. Uh, and the clusters have gotten a lot quicker. So, um, and the way the treatment planning works is you do, your, you do your treatment plan, and you put in your constraints, you put in your CT scan, and then the cluster, when this started, the clusters would have to work overnight to calculate all the to calculate the fluence uh, inside the patient. And then after it did that, the next day, then you, once it did the pre-calculation, you could do the um, iterative planning. Uh, and you could modify things the next day. But um, so anyway, this is, this is probably the most conformal, uh, most conformal isodose distribution you can get on a patient. So it's a small 6 MV Linux. It's only 6 MV. Precise binary MLC open selectively as GAN actually rotates. Couch moves during treatment. We said that superior tumor coverage and reduction of OER dose. Well, that can be used for, and then remember how once, uh, I think it was the last lecture or the one before that, I said that you could detune this LINAC, reduce the energy from a 6 MV to something like a 3 MV, and then you can you can take MVCT with those with that detuned energy. Why do you detune it? What's the purpose of detuning it? To get a better contrast. Yeah, to get a better contrast. So you're your effective energy or your average energy is lower, thus creating more photoelectric effects and, and less content effect. So uh, treatment times can be long. So now, this the disadvantage of tomotherapy 
you know, the, the take-home message was the, the advantage of tonal therapy is a high degree of conformity. You can shape isoglose lines around structures like you wouldn't believe. The disadvantage is it's very inefficient, and that sounds like a, uh, that sounds like uh, I'm putting it down. But I mean by inefficient is that it doesn't deliver a lot of dose in one field, since these since this distribution here is only through a single slot, it's delivering a very small amount of dose uh, for time. Right? But it's doing it very selectively, and it's putting the dose in certain places. And so it takes about 30 minutes to treat a patient. Don, is that correct, you know? I mean, that's how it was from last time. Have you been involved at all? Yeah, uh, the, the two and a half centimeter slice thickness, the mm -hmm. treatments are usually only about 10 minutes, but if they drop down to one centimeter slices, that can shoot them up to 20 or less. Yeah, and so that, that explains that it talks to the efficiency. The smaller you get, the less dose you get for time, and the less efficient it is. So is TOMO strictly IMRT? TOMO strictly IMRT. There's been some, um, there's been some push to, to make it non-IMRT, so, such as breast. Because you may not want to treat the breast IMRT. Because imagine if you're rotating around it, around this way here, you don't need to treat through here if, you, if the breast is here, right? You want to restrict all your dose in this direction. So they, they have this, uh, this uh, technique called TOMO Direct. And I believe the way TOMO Direct works is it starts treating at only a certain angle. And they can keep the beam on. And then what they do is, so you're treating a slice, and then the patient moves in this direction. So you can, mod, you can modulate the dose, but the gantry, do, the gantry doesn't move. I believe that's how the tumor director it's, it's a static gantry motion. And that was, that was in the works last, last time I heard. I don't know if it's, uh, if it's clinically accepted, clinically available, rather. So let's look at the MVCT and, and uh, compare this. So this is part of IGRT. So this is a regular KVCT on the left, and this is the same patient on the right. And just I just wanted to show you these two so you could see how noisy you see how noisy they are. Yeah, they're noisy up here. Okay, but it's still not bad. I mean, this doesn't look like an MV image. And the reason that there's a the reason the contrast isn't so bad is because CT has inherent contrast since it has so much information uh, that you can bring the contrast with more information out in the, in the image. Okay, rapid arc. So, so tomotherapy came around and said, "Well, we're in big trouble. <laughs> tomotherapy is going to take over the world, right? Because the conformity is so much better than static IMRT." And by the way, the timeline was three-dimensional treatment planning, where we started using 3D images, etc. Uh, and then forward planning came around, and then static beam IMRT came around. Static beam means means that the the, the gantry doesn't move move during beam on time. And then tomotherapy came around, and then rapid arc. So that's kind of the program, the timeline. So Baron was doing very well with IMRT. Actually, IMRT kind of turned our world upside down when static beam IMRT came, because uh, we could do so much more with IMRT. And um, and uh, and then so Baron was kind of I think they were very, they got very comfortable. And tomotherapy came around and said, look look at how much more we can do now. So this is how Baron countered. So they said, well, we've got, we've got this LINAC, we've got an MLC, the LINAC rotates just like your tomal therapy LINAC does. We should be able to do tomal therapy, but now, not with just a, a narrow slot, we should be able to do it with the entire field. So that's the idea behind rapid arc. So in rapid arc, the gantry rotates around the patient, and as it rotates, lots of stuff's going on. The gantry, the gantry speed um, is constant, but the dose rate can modulate. So the MU per minute, you guys know that a LINAC goes from about 200, 100 MU per minute to 600 MU per minute, right? A regular LINAC. They can modulate that dose rate okay, for certain purposes. The leaves can move. Okay, so those, those are the three things. Gantry's moving, dose rate is modulated, and the leaves are moving. So now there's a lot, a lot more computing power necessary. Although the computing power is still not at the level of total therapy. So as it's doing that, um, the gantry analysis moves simultaneously. The, the advantage of doing this is that you can deliver the plan as the gantry moves, so you can deliver an entire plan in two minutes, an entire treatment in two minutes. IMRT, just static field, regular static field IMRT, takes, I mean, it depends. If you're doing a prostate, it could be, prostate could be seven to 10 minutes. A head and neck could be 25 minutes. Like Glenbrook Hospital doesn't have rapid arc, 
and it may take about 20 to 25 minutes to treat a head and neck with static field IRT. So rapid arc is amazing, two minutes to deliver a treatment that is just as conformal or more conformal as static IRT. You don't need as many monitor units. So that's a plus for things such as scattered dose to the patient, shielding for the room. Okay, so those are big, those are big deals right here. So if we convert it from static field to IMRT and we said we're not going to do any more static field IMRT, we're going to do everything rapid arc, you can actually reduce the amount of shielding you have in your walls. Not that you do that, it's crazy. But if you're starting from scratch and you're building a, a facility and you're going to say, well, are we going to do any static field IMRT? Yeah, we'll do static field in this room and rapid arc in this room. You would need more shielding for the IMRT because your MEAs would be a lot higher. Okay, I mean, they're a lot higher. Better conformity than conventional IMRT, we know that. And then this rapid arc competes with tomotherapy. And let's see what the next slide is. Okay, so now with tomotherapy, Tomotherapy attempts, sorry, I take it back. Rapid arc attempts to deliver the treatment as quickly as possible. So it, its dose rate is pegged at 600 MU per minute. It attempts to use 600 MU per minute the whole time. And, but sometimes it can't because, sometimes I shouldn't say it can, it can, but sometimes there are reasons why you want to reduce the dose rate. And those reasons are, um, let's see, so if, um, if the gantry is rotating at a certain point, and there's OERs and critical structures there, and they don't want to deliver too much dose to the OER at a certain, at a certain angle. Let's say the, the, the optimizer says at this angle, um, you need to deliver, uh, you don't want to deliver too much dose to the OER, so at that point it'll drop the dose rate just to get through that spot. Because it's not gonna, it's, it's not gonna speed the gantry through. Because controlling a, a huge gantry, controlling the speed accurately of a huge gantry is a lot more difficult than controlling the dose rate. So if there's a spot where it says, I don't want much dose here, it's going to drop the dose rate. Okay, so that's one reason it's going to drop the dose rate while it's, while it's going through. Another, another limitation of, of rapid arc is as it's going around, let's just, maybe we can take this as an example. Here's a parotid. Okay, here's a parotid. Sorry, that's a tumor. Here's the parotid. Tumor parotid. And then here's spinal cord. Okay. So let's say... Um, uh, let's say uh, I'm going to drop the dose rate. Okay, like I said, the gantry speed can't change. So as it's coming around, it might it might see at this angle right here. It might see an opportunity to block this to block this field right here. To block. Sorry, to block this field, meaning the to block the spinal cord, and it'll see an opportunity to block the parotid right here, and then it'll open this whole area up here to treat the tumor. It'll say this is an optimal gantry where I can just block these two and blast away here. Okay, it's a great place to blast to deliver a lot of a lot of dose to the tumor, and and ideally, if you think about it, you'd want to leave the gantry there for quite a while. So you want to weight this angle a lot more than other angles. For example, take this angle. This one, this angle, you won't, wouldn't want to weight that much because you're going to shoot through parotid, you're going to shoot through spinal cord, and that's not. And then, and then, um, and so you'd be under treating this this area here. But this is a really good angle. But as the gantry is going through, it's going. Oh, I want to. I want to stop and I want to treat this angle really with a lot of weight, but it has to keep moving. So that's it. That's a limitation of rapid arc, that it has to keep moving. You can't stop there and deliver more dose. I mean, they can peg the dose to 600 MU per minute, but that's all it can do. So, when rapid arc first came around, it was a single rotation treatment. The double rotation, now that we could do double arcs, now what we could do is we can address this, the issue. So the optimizer says, okay, you're, giving, you're allowing me two arcs to treat this. So on the first arc, I'm going to treat as much as I can, and then on the second arc, I'm going to give it a little bit more. So it has two opportunities to treat at that angle. That's just an example of uh, the, du the double arc versus a single arc. Okay. So the conformity when we when we got the ability to do multiple arcs went went a lot higher than we had before because before we had that limitation. Okay. Does that make sense? All right. Solid metal compensators <clears throat> for MRT. This is something else. This is not that common, but it's used for uh, facilities that want to do IMRT on a machine but don't have the financial 
ability to upgrade the machine to an MLC-based machine. So this machine is just a, a jaw, it just has jaws, maybe asymmetric jaws. And they can, what they can do is they can do all their inverse planning, and then instead of saying create the MLC shapes, they're going to order a, a compensator. So they send the information to the compensator lab, and the compensator lab comes back and delivers this beautiful looking uh, compensator that's mounted on a tray. And each tray corresponds to one field. And uh, so when they treat a certain field, they go in the room, they put the tray in, they deliver the monitor units, they stop, go in the room, take the tray off, put the other tray in. So the disadvantage of compensators is that you're running, running in and out of the room, right? But the therapist gets in, gets in, they get a little bit of a workout compared to the therapist today. The therapists today don't have to go in the room for anything. So these guys get a little bit more of a workout. Another advantage is this is a lot more efficient than tomotherapy or static field MRT or rapid art because you can run the MUs full tilt all the way. You can do 600 MU per minute the whole time. Okay, so during beam time, it's a lot quicker. But then the entire treatment, the entire treatment is probably quicker for this as long as the therapists are really quick. <laughs> Go in and out and switch this out. Okay, so uh, the the speed of delivery between this solid compensator-based MRT and static field MRT is probably comparable. And this is just a this is just a graphic of, that I got from the website of how it works. Radiation beam is, see this beam is a, the fluence pattern looks the same, it's even, the distribution is even. Once it hits the compensator, these, this area here on the outside, the fluence is reduced on the outside, and, is in, and the fluence in the middle is untouched. Here's some, here's your tumor, and these are your organs at risk. So you can, so it uses the internal structure to, to shield the organs at risk and, and treat the tumor. I have a question. Yeah, no, not that small. I've only seen one. It was a hand patient. Uh huh. How familiar are you with that vessel? How like have you used it? I used to use it a lot when um, when it first came out. And it was used as just a compensator, not an MRT compensator, but a, a regular surface compensator. All right. We used it a lot. Um, this is going to be a weird question. When we got ours, they assumed the patient using an alpha cradle. And then sent that in, got the dot decimal shape, the dot decimal came back, and the bottom of the dot decimal was flat, but the alpha cradle couldn't form to the hand, so we had to remake alpha cradles to fit it, which means that the dot decimal wasn't in the same shape because the hand wasn't the same, and it was just a horrible mess. So you used the compensator to treat a hand? Yeah, hmm. it was a right index finger that they were treating the top half and did not want to treat the bottom half. We don't know. I don't know. I would not use a compensator for that application just because the position of the hand is going to highly affect, um, the position of the hand relative to the compensator is going to highly affect the dose distribution. Right. So if you don't get that right on, and these are small structures you're talking about, if you don't get that right on, you could be doing more damage than you think. Yeah. We all, nobody understood why the doctor ordered it, but yeah. it did. So. When you were making the immobilization tools, do you send in a contour of the immobilization no. tool? Or no, you send in the CT scan. Right. So, you, so you'll do the immobilization tool, make the immobilization tool, put whatever you're putting on it, put body, body part in it, and scan it. You send the whole scan. So they right. can see the immobilization tool, the immobilization device, uh, but they don't really use the, the information of the immobilization device to build a compensator. They use the anatomy, external strikes. So do you always have to make a new set of immobilization devices when you get the compensator? No, well, you're going to use the same immobilization device that you use when you scan. But if they don't shape the compensator to the immobilization device, then it won't fit. No, but they're shaping it to the structure. Okay. Right to the hand. So as long as as long as long the hand is in the same position as your CT scan, they built the, they built the compensator to compensate for the irregular surface of the hand. And if you position the hand with your isocenters in the right spot, and you mounted the compensator correctly, those will all match up. Oh, okay. If you make another mobilization device for the hand, the right, hand right. might be on another position. Okay. We're talking two different things. Oh, the, okay. this, mobilization, this compensator was placed directly on the hand, not put it back on oh. the hand. No? No, it was a plastic. Oh, okay. Plastic compensator. Oh, I okay. apologize. Okay, okay, okay. So, okay. I see, I see. Okay, so this makes sense. Okay, because then the compensator will fit right on the front. Right. Yeah. Okay. But with the immobilization device, it was bowed up around the hand uh -huh. where it foamed up, 
and the commentator was cut flat. It wasn't cut as uh, much where the compensation okay. device. Yeah. So, it, but it sounds like you've used the metal ones where you just mount it. Yeah. Okay, the my apologies. Oh no, no. Okay, so, it's, yeah, the compensator company is not going to look at the mobilization right. device. They're not going to unless you contour that. Okay. You can contour it. And then they can. Mm, that's that's tricky too. Oh, that's tricky too because you can contour it, but it's using the heterogeneity of the air to calculate the compensation. Right. And so, yeah, it's, I don't see how that could fit. And that's that's where you call them. You just call the company and say, company. "This is the story. This is we want this to fit." Yeah. All right. Mm. Yeah, because that's a special case. Yeah. It was a very interesting case. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I think that if you contour. If you contour the mobilization device, the alpha cradle, and they know that the compensator shouldn't be cut below that because it's not going to fit, then they can probably they can probably shave it down. They can probably do something about that. Yeah, I'm just thinking of how. Yeah, I mean if because this is meant to go right on the hand, so right. that's the purpose of this thing. Right. So I think it would work if you contour the stuff around it or between the fingers, and they'll know that this the hand plus the structure that it's sitting on is the structure that the compensator has to fit to, and you call that just one structure, then I don't see how they can't do that. I think that they could do that. But I think that there was a confusion there because there's a distinction made between the hand and the alpha cradle, or the alpha cradle just wasn't factored into it. I'm pretty sure they didn't contour the cradle. Yeah, yeah. That's it, it sounds like it was one of the first times that an alpha of dot decimal cradle, uh, dot decimal had been used. Mm. But that's a good idea to treat that treat a hand evenly. It's a good yeah. idea because it'll make the distribution even throughout inside the hand. Right. Well, anyway, those are the motors I just showed you guys. Uh, segmented MLC. Now, <clears throat> two types of IMRQ, side of field IMRQ delivery. So those first few slides were just an overview. So let's go into uh, into how it actually works. IMRT delivery, IMRT delivery is based on either segmented MLC or sliding window MLC. Now, segmented MLC, also known as SMLC, of course, is also known as step and shoot. Beam turns off while MLC is moved to their next position. And good sparing of OERs, so segmented MLC, you can spare OERs really well because the leaves can stay in a position for, for a long time and, and just completely block it. Uh, and, and the engineering is simple. In other words, there are less um, uh, there are less things that are happening simultaneously. In other words, the beam is when the MLCs are moving, the beam is off, okay, so it doesn't have to keep track of those right. Uh, and the other thing too to remember about step and shoot is dose rate rate is constant. Okay, so you can run it at a high dose rate when the beam is on. So after the MLCs have gotten into place. The beam can be on it at the highest dose rate. So how does this work? Well, step one, uh, MLCs move to first position. Okay, step two, beam on, uh, the MLCs move, then um, stop after they get to their position. Then beam on. The MLCs move to a new position. Move, okay. Stop and then beam on. Okay, so pretty simple. This happens over and over and over. How many times does it happen? Well, it happens for each segment. Okay, so this is once this is one segment, and this is another segment. So at each at each segment, this is going to occur. Uh, now, step and shoot has approximately. I mean, if you're treating proxy, you're probably going to have 25 segments per field. That's just an approximate number. Okay. And this is mechanically, it's very simple. MLCs move, they stop, the beam is on. Um, and again, and this is a very, is a more efficient way of delivering the dose because the step and shoot MLCs uh, deliver a larger field. Okay, so a larger field compared to sliding window, and I'll show you that in a minute. So the field is relatively large, and just as a, I'll show you what a step and shoot MLC. It might look something like this. I mean, I'm just going to put some, some leaves in here. I mean, it might look something like this. So the segment is the segment that you're treating uh, is pretty large. So you're treating something in here. This is your treatment area. Okay, and uh, you might be one. You might be blocking something over here, and you might be treating something over here. Okay, so it's pretty large, and there might be, like I said, 25 of these. 
So it's efficient. You're treating a large area on first with step and shoot. Okay, uh, static gantry, dynamic MLC. So this is also static gantry. This is a static gantry, but this is also static gantry up here. So sliding window techniques, it's only available on the Eclipse machine. Step and shoot is available on, um, well, there's only one, mach one other machine now. <laughs> is it with a K? I think it's with a K. Electro. It used to be available on Siemens and Electro. Well, Siemens is out of the radiation oncology business. Of course, there's a lot of Siemens machines out there, but step and shoot is available on Electro. And Siemens, mm, can you do step and shoot with Varian? It, yeah, you can. You can do step and shoot with Varian, but it's still, it uses a sliding window algorithm. Okay, so Varian, what does Varian do? Varian, gives, uh, Varian has the availability of uh, sliding window, and that algorithm and the leaf sequencing is, is different than a step and shoot leaf sequencing. The advantage of sliding window is that the, you get better tumor coverage, and it's more conformal, tends to be more conformal, but you need more monitor units because it's less efficient. The field size that it treats over is smaller. Uh, and then uh, one other complication is that the MLCs, MLCs move during beam on. Okay, so that's a bit of a complication during um, during beam on. Okay, and then volumetric arc therapy, that's the last one. Uh, this is rapid arc. And VMAT is the general term used for rap rapid arc is the variant trade name. Uh, but uh, Electa, Electa calls it VMAT, and that's when the MLC gantry rotates simultaneously. We just talked about that. Okay, and then let's talk about some terms here. Beamlets. A beamlet is a beamlet is the um, is a little section of the a little section of the treatment area. This this little schematic here represents three just three leaves. On the left, three leaves on the right, and the beamlet is defined as this little segment right here, a little square or beam. And the reason we need to define that is when, we're, when the treatment planning computers are doing the calculations, it needs to know the size of the beamlets and the intensity delivered by each beamlet at a particular time to be able to calculate the dose. The size of the beamlet determines the conformity resolution. So if these beamlets are smaller in either direction, we can get a better conformity. Because imagine if you're restricted to beamlets of two sizes, a 5 by 5 and a 10 by 10 beamlet, you can't get two, your fluence is not going to be really, the resolution is not going to be really good. You're just going to have these big areas of 5 by 5 and 10 by 10. As your beamlets get smaller, your little segments get smaller, you're now able to change the size of beamlets and also change the amount of intensity in the beamlet. So there are two parameters here in IMRT. Is one is the beamlet size. And the available level um, levels of dose, levels of dose. Okay, and with XCO you can set this this value right here. You can actually set it, and you can say I want 20 levels of dose or 10 levels of dose. When you guys do IMRT, if you're going to use XCO, you actually tell it how many levels, and and so the number of levels. If you, if you have two levels of dose, that means that uh, you can have, I don't know, say 10 centigrade and 20 centigrade in beamlet. You can't have anything else. Okay. So that restricts you. But if you can have 10, and 20, and 30, and 40, 100, then for that beamlet, you can deliver either 10 centigrade or you can deliver 100 centigrade in that beamlet. And that's an advantage because if your tumor's right here, you'd want to deliver 100. If your all is there, you want to deliver 10. So it gives you more flexibility in terms of your, of your conformity. Um, okay, so intensity resolution is limited by the smallest deliverable MU. That's another thing too. As, as these beamlets are being delivered, um, as the leaves are stepping through, either in step and shoot or sliding window, the number of, there's a certain number of MUs that are being delivered. Uh, and at some points, you may not want to deliver too many monitors. But you're restricted. There's a restriction on the linear accelerator with your minimum number of monitor units. So to deliver, and if you guys do QA on the Linux and you do linearity and you linearity, it looks like this. So this is um, 
this is mu, and this is dose per mu. Okay. And then what you want is this is your mu increases, your dose per mu should be should be constant. It should get a straight line. Okay, makes sense. If you deliver if you deliver 100 mu, you should deliver you should get um, one, you should get. You should always get one centigrade per mu. For example, if you deliver 100 mu, you should get 100 centigrade. But what happens is, and that's fine, and this is straight here. But what happens out here, in in fact, if you, once you take some measurements, what happens out here? Once you start hitting like two mu, of course you can you can do half an mu. So you say two mu and one mu, you'll start seeing that these values are higher. So for two mu, oh, let me create this. For 2 mu, no, it comes back. Nice. For 2 mu, you might get a value up here, and then for 1 mu, you're going to get a value up here. Okay. So that that's nonlinear, and you don't want to be in this area. You don't want to treat patients in this area because if you're treating patients with a whole bunch of 1 mu beamlets that are 1 mu and 2 mu, you're actually giving them more dose than you think you're giving. If you have a whole bunch of those segments, little little mu segments. Uh, and the reason that this happens is that the linear accelerator uh, has this effect called an overshoot effect. Overshoot. This is more of an issue with step and shoot SMLC. And the reason it's more of an issue is because um, the Linux has to uh, turn on and off very quickly. And when it turns on to deliver, say you get to a segment, remember how I said it's, it's step below. My, my notes are gone. But anyway, the MLCs move and then the MUs are delivered. Once it starts to deliver those MUs, uh, it always gives a little bit more. The dose rate's a little bit higher. And then it uses the subsequent MUs to reduce it. So it overshoots, and then the subsequent MUs, it, it measures how much it overshot, and then it says, okay, I'm going to give a little bit less of the subsequent MUs. But if it doesn't have enough time to account for it, it's going to be too high. Okay, so we have a, in step and shoot. You should limit your your um, mu per segment, and you can do this in X here. You can limit the number of mu's per segment and tell it you limit your mu to segment to about we like to use four. Okay, and that does hurt your conformity because the, the lower the number of mu's per segment, uh, the better conformity you can get. But it prevents this from happening up, up here. This overshoot. Okay, so this is just another, uh, this is a beam's eye view from an XEO screen. Okay, so you could turn on the intensity pattern when you're doing IMRT on XEO. You could turn on your intensity pattern and look uh, at your beam's eye view. So this is an example of a prostate. It looks like, it looks like a, um, yeah, it looks like a left lateral. Is that right? No, uh, right lateral. Okay, so here's, uh, the reason I say right lateral is because I'm going to assume the head's up here and the feet are down here. And we're seeing rectum here, and we're seeing prostate here. Okay, and then this is bladder over here, out here. Okay, so this is a right lateral, and you can look at your um, you can look at your intensity pattern. So what this is telling you is this is telling you that this area right here is going to get a lot of dose because those areas are dark, and this area out here is going to get very little dose. Why do you think this area is going to get high dose right here? from this beam. Well, it's probably because the other beams are um, are missing missing this part of the prostate, and this beam is going to account for that. Okay. IMRT works. I mean, it has its own algorithm in terms of how it decides where to deliver the doses. Sometimes it doesn't make any sense. Sometimes you think, wow, I shouldn't be shooting dose reader. But the reason it's doing that is because the other beams are not delivering dose in a particular area. Uh, and so what you could do also in XEO is um, you can you can modify the intensities of these and then you can also remove certain segments. So what you're seeing here is you see this blue line right here? Uh, that's the outline that's the outline of the field. Okay, right here. That's the outline of the field. And that's called a CIAO 
I mean, I forgot what that means. That's in one of the it's in one of the documents that I put up there. It's the, what it is. It's the most extended opening of the field. It's, the, it's what you're going to treat through. So anything outside of that is going to get no dose, and anything inside of that is going to get a fluence modulated dose. Okay, so that's the chow. Um, how is this dose created? Okay, so how how are these how are these uh, hot spots and cold spots created? Well, again, if you think about that, remember that um, that segment that I drew with the MLCs. That's one segment. If you take that one segment, let's draw a very simple version of it. There's a segment, and we're going to block this part here with MLCs. Okay, and then we're going to take another segment over here and block. Program. We're going to cut it to four to fours here. Okay, and then we're going to block this part. So this was this is going to be two MU. This is going to be two MU. And then we're going to do another segment over here. And we're going to do this again, 2MU. Okay. We're going to do another segment over here. And then we're going to, we're going to make this 10MU. Okay. What do you think this is going to look? So once you deliver this 2, 2, 2, and, and 10, what do you think it's going to look like? Well, let's... If you look at the field, the resulting field, and we apply a value of dose to it, or let's just let's just sum up the let's just sum up the MUs for each for each quadrant, all right? So how many MUs is this quadrant going to get? Or twelve? Just two and two. And this one? Well, two from this one. This one's blocked. Oh, I see. This one's blocked. I was thinking the opposite. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, the blocked is the lines, yeah. Okay, how about this one? 14. Yeah, 14. This guy? 16. And the last guy? 6. So the last guy gets 6, okay. So, this gives you an idea of the intensity pattern that you're going to get in there. So, uh, this is going to be the darkest. And then there's this one, and then there's other, and there's this other. So that's how, this is a very simplified, we just made a very simplified um, MLC segmentation algorithm. Okay. So that's how it goes from, here's the, here's the fluence that XU would like to deliver. And it says, well, how am I going to deliver that? Well, I've got to overlap all these MLC shapes to get that. Okay. And we have, I mean, we have, here it looks like we have the ability to deliver 16 levels. Okay. Uh, and then here, I mean, we're seeing a lot of levels here. I'm seeing, you know, I'm seeing at least eight levels of gray here. Okay, so you have at least eight levels of gray to play with. So, of course, the more levels you have, the, the, the bigger the difference and the bigger the variety, the more um, flexibility you have with, with um, how this is going to look and how you can treat it. Okay, does that make sense? It's as simple as that. You're just overlapping segments. That's for step and shoot. Sliding, one's a little, sliding one is a little more complicated. Sliding window is um, is based on. Remember the leaves move while during while the beam is on, and they move continuously. Okay, they tend not to stop. And here's here's the theory behind it. This is um, on the right here. We have an AP beam from a prostate. Okay, so it looks like we want to treat the sides of the prostate, and we're trying to keep this cool because the rectum's in the middle. Okay, so there's some hot hot areas we want to treat a lot here and here. And so let's look at let's look at a profile through let's look at a profile through this section through that red line right there. How are we going to deliver this profile? Well, here's what the profile looks like. There's low dose here where the rectum is, and then increases to a peak and then drops off. How do we deliver that with with sliding window? Um, well, to deliver this intensity product profile, the leading leaf remember the leaves are moving in this direction. The leading leaf travels at a maximum velocity while the trailing leaf modulates the dose. So this leaf here is going to fly across the field to get to the other side and make room for this one. And this one's going to be doing all the work. This leaf is going to be doing the um, modulation of intensity. And the dose rate and the speed of this leaf is going to determine the shape of that curve. Okay. So if we look at that, method could be important. If we look at that, doesn't that look like a dynamic wedge? Isn't that how a dynamic wedge works? The, the wedge moves across the field, right? 
That's exactly what that is. It's a dynamic wedge at one slice. Okay. It's as simple as that. And it's actually a little more complicated dynamic wedge because a dynamic wedge actually has stops that it stops at. Okay. That's, dynamic wedge is more, more of a step issue. This is more continuous. So there's more uh, flexibility with this. Uh, so imagine if this, if, what, if this lead moves pretty quickly too across the field, you're going to get, let's see, if it moves quickly, you're going to get a pretty shallow uh, distribution. Is that right? Yeah. And if it moves slowly, you get more steep distribution. Okay, because if it moves slowly, this part here is going to stay open longer. So, so the difference between this part and this part will be greater. So that gives you an idea how if this moves slowly, this is steeper. If it moves fast, it's shallower. Okay? And then the the and it doesn't need to be linear, it can change its velocity. So you see how this is flat here and then it gets steeper? So maybe this it starts quickly here and it slows down to create that kind of exponential curve. All right? So that's how sliding window works. Now, what's the limitation? Let's see what's the next slide. So what's the limitation of this sliding window? The limitation is leaf speed. Okay, you'd want it, you'd want to run that, I mean, the leaf can go from zero, it can stop. But you want to run at least as fast as possible in some cases. But your limitation per variant is 2.5 centimeters per second, which is pretty good. It actually, it can actually go like four or six. I've seen these things move at four centimeters per second. But it starts to throw a lot of errors in the computer. So the spec is 2.5 centimeters per second. If you're in that speed, you're, you're OK. Uh, I, believe, uh, I believe there's an interlock or, or some, something in the treatment planning computer. Somewhere in there, you can limit the speed of the leaf. Or it could even be hard coded. OK, that's, that's letting window. All right, being the, you know what? Let's stop here, because this is being data requirements and other subjects. Let's take a quick break. <clears throat> All right, so let's get into some physics here. And this is just one quick slide on beam data I'm going to talk about because, in fact, in fact, going, choosing to do IMRT and asking yourself, well, what kind of new beam data do I need to do IMRT is really not that big a leap. There isn't that much more. And here's what you need to do. Do you hear the differences? And of course, that, that depends on what treatment planning computer you're, you're going to use. Okay, different planning computers require different data. Uh, and so what you need to do is you tend to need to measure PDDs for smaller, smaller field sizes. Okay, and I know that XCO definitely requires this. Variant requires, I, I, believe they, I believe they ask down to 2 by 2. But you need to measure PDDs profiles for smaller beams. Now this comes with its own set of challenges because you need you know that you need special chambers to measure small uh, PD special chambers meaning smaller chambers so you can use micro chambers or diodes to measure smaller fields so you need to take in, you need to take into consideration that um, you're going to you're going to have to use a smaller chamber for smaller fields uh, and also the setup is a little bit more accurate you have to take a little more care and a little more time when you do this the other thing is that um, the radiation field offset, and I don't know if you guys have heard of this, but let me explain to you what this is really quickly. I might have mentioned this in another lecture. I'm going to draw um, a leaf, a side view of a leaf, a variant leaf. Okay, variants have around the leaf tips, right? And then I'm going to draw a projection of the light field. Okay, here's a projection. Well, that should be touching. Projection of the light field. No, no. I'm trying to select that. I can't select it. I think I can select this thing. Uh, no, anyway. Where's my drawing? <clears throat> I'm just going to have to draw it again. Here's a leaf. And there's a projection of the light field. But. Here's the projection of the 50% line. Remember this drawing I had one time? Remember that drawing? OK, the 50% line, if I was to draw a profile of the intensity from open field through the leaf, the 50% would hit somewhere somewhere around here. Okay, And the 0%, zero well, whatever the transmission through the leaf is, would be somewhere out here. So there's a, there's a difference. And we know that the 
the edge of the field is defined as a 50% isotope spot. Okay, we've mentioned that before in this class. And that's pretty standard. So if the if the light field and the edge of the field, uh, the, the dosimetric field edge don't correspond, and you know, I'm, I'm calling this light field, but really this is leaf position, okay, wherever the position of the leaf is. Okay, I'm calling it light field because the position of the leaf relative to the central axis, here's the central axis, this position is the physical position of that tip. And that physical position of that tip is going to define the light field. But it's not going to define the dosimetric edge. So there's a difference here. Now, as it turns out, that this difference makes a huge effect on your animals and on your acidosis. Because think of what's happening during, this is just for RT. Think of what's happening during RT. Those leaves are being dragged through the field back and forth. They're moving back and forth through the, leaf, through the field. So if there's a difference here, at every spot, every time the leaf, at every spot where the leaf um, sits, there's going to be an offset. Okay. And so there's going to be a difference here of about 50% dose in this small area. So this, this is a huge difference. And if you don't calculate your radiation field offset correctly, your primary TQAs will not pass. Your acidosis will look incorrect. So um, this RFO is the distance between the dosimetric uh, edge, the 50% of the field, and, and the position of the leaf. Now, how do you measure that? There's a lot of ways of doing this. Um, I did it, let's see, how did I do it? I did it many years ago. Here's how I did it. I took a piece of film. Oh, and by the way, this RFO uh, is entered into your treatment planning computer. So your computer actually needs this to calculate the doses because um, it's going to use this to offset the leaves. So what I did many years ago is I, I placed, I created an MLC pattern, and I, um, let's see, I drew, I drew a pattern that looked like this. I had a leaf out here, and then a leaf out here, <coughs> and a leaf out here, and I had different leaf positions, and then I, I drew the, um, I drew the light field. So I was shining a light field on this film, and with a pen, I very accurately drew where that light field intersects the leaf. Okay, and then, and then uh, I irradiated this, and then I realized, and then you could see the offset of the leaf. Okay, so you could see that the leaf, that the um, the edge of the field was offset from uh, from where I drew. And then what I did is I mo I shifted these, each of these I did it again, I repeated it, and I shifted them in. I shifted this one. Uh, 0.1 millimeters. I shifted this one 0.2 millimeters. I shifted another one. So I did this multiple times. 0.3 point, and I went all the way down to one centimeter. So I gave them all a shift, and then I picked the one that best matched the lines. Okay. So repeat, I'm going to repeat. So I, I start with a piece of film with the MLCs coming in at different distances, and the reason they come in at different distances is just so I can distinguish them. And then so I. I place the film on the couch, draw, and I draw the lines where I can see the shadow of the, of the MLCs. And you have to do this really accurately with a very thin pen. Okay, and then I irradiated it. Okay. And then I saw that there's a shift between my pen line and the, uh, and the shadow of the leaf, as there should be because of that offset. Okay. There's a shift. And then what I did is I moved each of these in a different amount. So this one I didn't move. I left this. I left zero. I left this the way it was. This one I moved inwards this direction, 0 0.1 millimeters. It's a very small shift. And then I, how am I doing this? How am I shifting this? I did this with Shaper. Shaper is a program that comes with Varian, and you can create any MLC pattern by typing numbers in. Okay. And then so with Shaper, I type these values in for the leaf positions. Okay, and then I did this one is 0.2 millimeters, 0 0.3 millimeters, 0 0.4 millimeters. Okay, that's that's one thing I did. And I did that all the way to 1 cm. Uh, sorry, 1 millimeter. I did that all the way to 1 millimeter. And then I picked, and I went down here, and I said, boy, these are all um, th these are all not enough. And then I, I, I noticed that the 0 0.7 for me was the one that worked best. In other words, the shadow of the leaf sat right on top of my pencil line, and the pencil line came from the light field. And that that would be the best. Okay, so then I so then that tells me that the 0 0.7 is the RFO. 0 0.7 is the radiation field offset. Okay, that's one way you can do it. 
Okay, and, there, and there's a couple of other ways. There's another way where you can, um, let's see, you can, you can drive a leaf. Um, you can drive a leaf in this direction and shoot a film, and then drive a leaf in this direction and shoot a film. And so, and so you start with, with them abutting. Of course, they can't abut together because they're going to hit into each other. So you have to drive one and then drive the other. Okay, move one other way and drive the other. And then you, t you measure the profile between them. Okay. And you, you repeat this for different overlaps. Okay, so you tr first you, tr you do zero, where they would be in the same spot, and you get something like that. And then you do one overlap where, this, where this, the position of this leaf overlaps the other position. Once it gets out of the way, they can overlap each other. And what happens is that this starts to get shorter. This, this, this doesn't look shorter. This Gaussian type curve starts to get. Uh, oh. This starts to get shorter, which means that um, they start to overlap. And so when you, when you calculate an overlap where there's no, no dose down here, that's what you can call the arc point. So that's another way of doing it. Uh, an additional way, and this is how Brain Lab does it, an additional way is oh, this is the, what Brain Lab does. Brain Lab is pretty smart because they use a dynamic arc hole. So they sweep, you have a chamber, they have you place a chamber in a phantom, and they sweep the leaves over the chamber. They sweep the leaves over the chamber, and uh, they sweep a gap of leaves. Leaves, rather. Here's this is a beam's eye view, by the way. So these are leaves, and then here's a gap. Okay, and this is the, where the radiation is. Okay, there's radiation in here, and they sweep this gap. And this is a farmer chamber, and sitting in a cham sitting in a in a phantom, and you've got your electrometer hooked up. Okay. And you're going to plot. You're going to plot reading versus gap. Okay. And you're sweeping this gap over the chamber. Okay, so this gap varies from, I don't know, it might start at 1 cm uh, here, 1 cm. Here's 0 0.5 cm, 0 0.1 cm. And, um, and what you do is you plot your reading you get. For, so for 1 cm, you should get the highest reading in 0.5. And then point one, and you draw this line. Or you draw this line so that if your gap is zero, you can extrapolate this line to a zero gap. The zero gap is when the leaves are touching closed. Okay, and that is synonymous with the last test I showed you guys, where they are overlapping and there's no dose. So this is where you pick your dynamic RFO. Oh, uh, sorry, the, the, the line. I'm the wrong. Line doesn't go like that. It goes like this. Line goes like this. Okay, so for a zero reading, your gap is somewhere down here. Okay, so that could be that's a very small number, whatever, 0.5 millimeters, etc. So that's a dynamic leaf uh, RFO. This is how Brain Lab does it. So I'm just giving you guys three three options on how to do it. The documents that I mentioned at the beginning of the, I believe one document explains one way of doing the RFO. And lastly, leaf transmission. Very important also. Because there's something that gets, how much gets through a leaf? Through not a leaf. How much gets through the average amount of transmission through an MLC leaf? Do you guys remember? 3%. Yeah, approximately 3%. Of course, it depends on the energy, right? And how would you measure that? You'd measure that just by placing a chamber um, through an open field and then comparing it to what the, what the transmitted radiation is. Okay, you compare. Now, these two values are going to be entered in your treatment planning computer, and your planning computer is going to use that. If they're incorrect, you're going to, your IMRTQ may not pass as well as it should. Okay. We've done a lot of measurements of this, and our IMRTQ is, we get really excellent results just because we put so much effort into this. But you should know things like, like Jimmy said. The MLC transmission is going to be around 3%, maybe 2%, Jimmy between 2 and 3 percent, okay? RFO, I remember this number, okay? 
0 0.7 millimeters, not centimeters, 0 0.7 millimeters. Just keep those numbers in mind so that when you're looking at, at your data, you should have numbers like this. These are numbers that you should have uh, available up in your up in your memory somewhere. Okay, fine. How many slides do I have today? So that's 33. Four. Oh, yeah. Oh, I got to I got to hurry up. Okay, treatment plan. Let's get this. Uh, treatment plan. The goal of IMRT is to reduce dose to normal structures while maximizing the dose to the disease. The advantage of IMRT over conventional 3D treatment planning, this is a new topic, by the way, we're, we're getting away from big data. Uh, the goal of IMRT, the take home message of IMRT is not that you're going to treat the tumor better, but that you're going to spare all the arch better. That's what it does. The goal of IMRT and the um, and the advantage of IMRT is that it spares OER, to take home message, that's it. IMRT can also be used to improve dose conformity, okay, so it can shape it a little bit better, but ideally it's um, it's the tool meant to reduce OER, or reduce OER dose. But why is, so if you can reduce OER dose, then, I mean, from that you can infer that you can increase PTV dose, right? Because if you can reduce, because what's limiting you from getting more dose to the PTV? Your OER. So, implicitly from that, you can give more dose to the PTV. Achieve through delivery of dose by beamlets. We talked about that. The intensity of each beamlet is adjusted for an optimization algorithm. We haven't talked about that yet. The algorithm requires information about the shape, location, structures, and desired maximum minimum doses for each of these structures. Okay, and you'll, you guys will look, do a lot of this with Theo. The optimizer algorithm performs iterative dose calculations to achieve a solution. So, what we're talking about here, the solution, what is the solution? The solution is the fluence pattern that we saw. This is the, what you're looking for. You're looking for the fluence pattern that's going to deliver uh, the dose that you want. Okay, remember that fluence pattern with all the different grayscales? That's your solution. The final solution is in the form of a dose intensity pattern. Uh, the last step is to create a set of MLC shapes that are delivered. And what's this? This is called MLC sequencing. And we talked about that in a very simple form back that other slides with the three quadrants. Okay, sequencing. All right. Okay, IMRT proxy coverage. So this is an example of an IMRT, what's the last slide here? Uh, IMRT isodose distribution for a prostate. Now, if you look at this, if they, sh if they show you this in your boards and they say, is this IMRT or conventional 3D treatment planning? I mean, right away, once you see an isodose line that's shaped like this, goes around, okay, then that has to be IMRT. 3D conformal cannot create isodoses that, sh that curve in this direction. They can create isodoses in the shape and the curve in this direction, but not convex. Okay? Only concave. Sorry, convex, concave. They can't go in. Okay? And the only way we can achieve this is by selectively attenuating certain certain areas through our fluence, through our uh, intensity modulated fluence. Okay, 3D, 3D treatment planning, traditional 3D treatment planning, back in the old, old days, it was a box. Okay? And then we got a little more sophisticated because it was a box because we just had um, um, we just had blocks. And then we, when we started doing 3D, then we got a little bit more sophisticated, and with 3D treatment planning, we could get isodose distributions that looked more uh, oval, like that, okay? But not not like this. That's only IMRT, okay? So that's the biggest difference. You could shape uh, your isodoses around structures. So inverse treatment planning, structures. Types of structures and prescription requirements target um, this this has to do with the information that we enter in the computer when we're doing the inverse treatment plan part. We need to enter minimum and maximum doses and weights. And we'll talk about that in a minute. I have a, I have a table I could show you. Organs at risk, dose bond constraints, we talked about that. Patient external contour. We also we, this is also important because we want to limit we want to limit dose like high doses in areas where there's no there's no PTV. Because I am the IMRT optimizer kind of does its own thing. And it can go crazy. I mean, it can start putting streaks of dose in areas of the body that uh, that have no PTV. But it says this is a really good spot. We need to put a lot of dose in. The way you constrain that is by constraining the amount of dose that goes to the patient's external surface. And you can say, I don't want more dose than, than this much inside the entire patient. And that that brings the isodoses down tight around the PTV. Planning techniques, pseudo structures used for dose shaping. You guys will be using those in treatment planning. Uh, and dose ring. So, example of a pseudo structure and a dose ring. This is a, this is the rectum. 
Okay, and then we're going to put a, a ring around the rectum, and this is part of the PTV. Now, before I get into this, really, the, the part of the, the inverse planning step where the optimizer calculates the fluence, what it does is it takes the structures that you've contoured and the constraints that you've given it, and it tries to shape the exodosis according to what you want it to do. So, as you can imagine, that the isodose distribution is going to be very dependent on your structures, right? Because it's using the shape of those structures to, to contour. So when IMRT came around, the um, the importance of a physician's accuracy of drawing those structures just shot way up. Because if the physician draws the wrong structure, you treat the wrong area. Okay. Uh, and, now, and then with IMRT, since you're able to, to curve things around certain areas, if the structure is incorrectly drawn, then you're you can be completely off. So you completely miss it or you can overdose it. So it's extremely important that the structures be drawn correctly. And so that's why imaging became more important, because we need to see better, to see the structures better. OK, that's just a, a little background about structures. Now, so we know how important the structures are. So then if we can use structures to modify our isodose distribution, then we can use things like um, this is the, this white part is a PTV. This could be part of the rec, part of the prostate up here. Then we can use things like dose shells around the rectum, so that the optimizer, if you want to treat the PTV fully, um, and in the rectum you don't want to give any dose, that's really hard to do. I mean, it's really hard to say I want um, 78 gray up here and zero in the rectum. Okay, the optimizer is going to really struggle with that. It's not going to know what to do because the optimizer is coming up with all these beamlet intensities and fluence patterns, and it's going to have a, it's going to have a hard time just because of the physics behind it. It's very hard to just drop the dose of one spot because of scattering, etc. So to to aid the optimizer, this is a trick you could do: is you place a dose shell around your OAR, and you say, well, I want 78 gray here, and I want um, 50 gray here. And I want 30 gray here. So now you're telling your optimizer that you're okay with the transition. It's a transition area. And the optimizer has an easier time with something like this. Okay. Another thing an optimizer has a hard time with is overlapping structures. So here's the PTV, say it's prostate again, and here's the rectum. This is an overlapping structure. You're telling it you want 78 gray here, and maybe you want 30 gray in the rectum. It's going to say, how can I give 78 and 30 gray in the same spot? Okay, so it gets confused with that. So try to avoid overlapping structures. Try to make the structure that you're most concerned about, make that the PTV. And then make your rectum like a half moon and not, not overlapping. Okay. Of course, now how does the rectum overlap on the PTV? Because it really can. I mean, the rectum can't be inside the prostate, right? The ones the rectum runs the prostate. Well, it, it occurs because you draw in your GTV. And you've drawn your rectum, and you well that shouldn't be overlapping. And you've got a and you've got a margin up here. That's how it happens, right? So that's that's the overlap because of the margin right there. Uh, so what you need to do is decide what you think is more important. Okay. Uh, so you've got to make decisions. This is where IMRT comes. The, the technique of IMRT is no longer drawing blocks, putting wedges. It's making decisions like this. So it's a different planning paradigm. Okay. So IMRT beams. So that's a little talk about structure. I'm just going to touch on these things because you guys are actually going to practice this. Treatment. MRT beams, how many beams do we use for, for static, static beam IMRTs? The more beams, the better, usually. Okay, so one extreme would be like four field IMRT. The other extreme would be rapid arc. Rapid arc is continuous. Okay? So in general, the more beams, the better because it gives the optimizer um, the ability to, to look from different perspectives to be able to cover and spare uh, your PTVs and OERs, respectively. So for prostate, these are just general rules of thumb. For prostate, six, if you're going to treat with 6MV, you need at least 7 beams. If you're going to treat with 10MV, you don't need as many beams because the 10MV penetrates more, and so it can deliver dose further down, deeper down, and so it has more to play with. The optimizer has more dose to play with. So you don't need as many beams. Head and neck, you need at least 7 beams. You should not treat head and neck with anything less than 7 beams because there's a lot of structures, parotids, cords, um, there could be eyes in the way, uh, there could be trachea, uh, the, the GTVs are usually an odd shape, they're usually very close to PTV, so it's a complicated problem, so you need more beams. 
Uh, beam direction, you're going to use trial and error approach. So you're just going to use a beam side, beam side view and orient your beams uh, so that you don't shoot through too much of the OER. A uh, collimator angle is also an interesting point. Collimator angle, a zero angle may not provide conformity since the five millimeter leaves may cover more than one CT slice. So say your CT scanner gives you slices that are two millimeters. Your structure might change between one slice and the other slice, the shape of your structure. But your MLC leaf is the same leaf. Okay. So if you rotate your collimator and you look at a beam's eye view, that can give you more flexibility and it can take out that lack of resolution of that five millimeter leaf. Okay. So a collimator turn might help you there. Um, and also, it reduces interleaf transmission. If you're delivering IRT, remember how the transmission between the leaves is higher than through the leaf? Remember that? So for every field, that, that little slice between the leaves might overlap. So you're delivering a lot of dose between the leaves, because that, that gap there is the same as you rotate the gantry. The gap sits in the same spot. Okay, so if you turn the gantry, you're calling it at 45 degrees, that gap's gone. Okay, so you can reduce. People might say, well, that's being picky because the patient moves from day to day, and that gap's going to move from day to day. And it could be true. You know? It might wash out from day to day. But turning the collimator 45 degrees will ensure that you don't have that full line. Okay, so those, this is the table, a uh, simple table that you'll see on XCO for IMRT. And uh, I don't throw you a lot of things at you guys, and I'm just talking today. But uh, <laughs> like I said, there's just so much to talk about IMRT. Those can trade some XCO examples. So what you're going to see in XCO is your list of structures that you've contoured. Here's your PTV, GTV. You might have two PTVs. Seminal vesicles, rectum bladder, and right femur. Okay, and then you write, and then you uh, classify: is it a target or is it an OAR? It has to know that. And then you give it a rank. Okay, and the rank is to avoid things like a PTV overlapping with the rectum. So if you give a PTV a rank of one and the rectum a rank of three, it's going to put more importance on this. And the rank applies only to this overlapping structure, by the way. That's all the rank does. The rank says, okay, well, I know that you've given the PTV more, more importance because you've ranked it higher than the rectum. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work harder to get the PTV to where you want it. Okay, so rank is only, it doesn't, has nothing to do with any structure that doesn't overlap. It's only for overlapping areas. Objective. So these are your objectives right here. Okay, so this is the heart of the optimizer. For your PTV, you're telling the optimizer that you want a minimum dose of 64 to 100% of the PTV. Okay, that's a little restrictive. This may be, it may be a better idea to use something like 98. It gives it a little bit of, of leeway. But anyway, 64 to 100%, and then maximum dose. You don't want your hotspot to be above 78. Okay, and this is why the volume is zero because it's just a spot. Okay, weight. This is how important each of these constrictions are. The optimizer needs to know how important you think this is. Okay. And then, so this is a usually a percentage. I like to think of it as a percentage. You can actually put any number between, I think it's zero and a thousand in there. But I always like to think of percentages. It makes more sense to me. Okay, and then power is like weight on steroids. Okay, now, if you change this from 100 to 90%, intuitively you could say you made a 10% change. If you change this to 2, from 2 to 2.1, it's about the same amount of change. Okay, so it's think of it as a power uh, in a mathematical equation. A power is a lot more powerful than a multiplication. Okay, so that's what that is. It's this. If you really want to change this a lot, or you want to put a lot of weight on it, modify that number. And this default is usually two. And this is status on or off. So do you want to do you want to consider this target or not? You can turn them on and off. And the reason this is nice is because at first you might want to just turn the PTV on and turn everything else off and let the optimizer run and see what your isodose distribution looks like, see what your coverage is like as a starting point. And then you turn on one thing, like you turn on your OAR. And you just give it not too much dose, just not too much weight, just a little weight, and see what it does. So the, a good rule of thumb for IMRT planning is take it step by step. Start with your starting point, modify something slightly, and then start modifying the other things that way, if something blows up and it doesn't look good, you could rewind and backtrack and start it and go back to where you thought were, you were okay. If you modify all this together uh, and you change things together, you won't know what your changes, you won't know how to uh, improve your other changes. 
because too many things are happening at the same time. Okay, that was a whirlwind tour of optimization. Optimizing takes about a year to learn, by the way. <laughs> so to get to get really good at it. It's just practice. Uh, this is, I don't know if I'm going to cover this. This is just OERs, and I've talked about OERs before. This is just data. Um, you know those tolerance tables that I've sent you guys, and you guys, not tolerance tables, I should say, tolerance doses uh, for structures. They all come from data like this. These are researchers that, that look at percent volume of, this is rectal grade 3 bleeding, and how much dose it requires to get a certain toxicity level. So this is where all the data is, okay? They come from here. So this is an example here. D30 less than 40 gray to the rectum. So D30 uh, less than 40 gray. So 30 is here. 40 gray is here. Something like that. Well, it's close to that. But uh, the dose constraints come, that we use come from data like this from these researchers. Okay, and this is for the kidney. Okay, so kidney again. Percent of kidney volume and the dose. And what happens? I mean, if you get a really high volume and a really high dose, you get peptic ulcers, gastric cancer, seminoma, seminoma, lymphoma, and as you come down, your side effects get lower and lower. Okay, so you want to be estimated threshold for injury. So you want to be for kidney, see, this is the, the threshold. So anything below there, you're not going to have any injury to the kidney. Once you start passing this, then you start to see the side effects. And this all comes from um, data, patient data. Okay, opti IMRT optimization. So this is, um, this is how the optimizer works. So let's go through. This is important that you know this. So let's go through this real quick. Okay. So the goal is to minimize the goal during the optimization stage. And what part of this? What part of the IMRT planning is the, uh, the optimization stage? You've um, done the CT scan on your patient. You've done the contours, OERs, um, PTVs. That's all done. And then the next step is that table. Fill out. Remember that table I was showing you? Fill out that table. That's the next step. And, and that's when the optimizer takes over. Once you're done filling out that table, then you hit optimize, and then this happens. Okay. So what is this? Oh, by the way, by the way, you've also placed your beams. Okay, so you arrange your beams. Okay, so you arrange your beams in the trial and error approach so you don't try not to hit through any OARs. Okay. So you arrange your beams. Um, you picked your beam energy. Okay, that's important too. And then you hit optimize. Now, the optimizer, uh, what it does is it first delivers um, an even amount of an even amount of dose. So it doesn't do any modulation yet. It delivers all the dose as if the square open beams. And then it calculates from there. It says, all right, well, how much did the organs get? And how much um, do you want to deliver to the organs? So that's what this equation does. This is the cost. So this is the cost of your plan. You always want to minimize your cost, right? All right, so you're going to minimize the cost. Now, n is the number of dose calculation points inside the structure. So here's a here's a beam, and here's your structure that you're trying to treat, the PTV, and here's your rectum. Okay, and we can we can break this up into grid. Just imagine there's a grid. I don't want to draw a grid because it's going to get messy. But just imagine there's a grid there, and each little segment in the grid is a beam. Line. Okay. And we have the ability to modify the dose in each beam line. So the cost function is going to be um, is going to be how bad how bad our plan is. So let's look at how this works. N is the number of dose calculation points inside the structure. So each structure has a bunch of calculation points because the planning computer has to calculate dose inside the structure, and it's based on a grid. Okay. So that's N. W is the weight. Remember that that weight in that table. Remember that weight? It was 100, 100. That's W. That's how important that is. And D0 is the desired dose at point R. D0 is the desired dose at one of the beamlets at a certain point. So there's a point here, there's a point here, there's points everywhere. And again, that's, this, that's established from the table that we saw a couple of slides ago. Okay. And DN is what it just computed. So the dose that it just calculated, that's the dose. Okay, so the initial one with open fields, that dose is going to be pretty much even throughout. Okay, so then let's calculate the, the cost. So the cost, you take the dose that um, the dose that you desire minus the dose that you just delivered, and square that. Okay, now if these are the same, you're done. This is zero, and your cost is zero. You're done. Okay, 
okay? But you're usually not done at the beginning. So in the first iteration, this is going to be a big number, and you're going to square it too. Okay, so that's a big number, and that big number is multiplied by the weight, and it does this for every point in that, in that field. And it does it over and over and over. Okay, and it calculates the cost. Okay. And then what it does, the optimizer, this is where the optimizers, there's some smart optimizers and there's some not so smart optimizers. Okay, now the smart optimizers are going to get to a solution very quickly where this is, where you're going to minimize this and this is going to become zero as quickly as possible. And there are different, there's a lot of different optimizers out there, like I said. Um, and so then once it calculates that dose, it says, I need to do something to each of those beamlets. I got to do something, I gotta, I'm going to change each of those beamlets. Well, obviously it's going to, make the beam lifts that cover the rectum, it's going to reduce them, reduce the intensity of those beam lifts. And it's going to maybe inc maybe increase the ones around the PTV. Okay, so that's what it's going to do in, the, in that first iteration. And then it's going to calculate the dose again each time. And it does this for every field. And, then, and every time it calculates dose, it comes up with a cost function. And it shows, it usually shows you the cost function on the screen. It looks like a graph. I'll show it to you in a second. Okay, this is how, this is how, this is how cool IMRT is. So it, it iterates over and over and over until it, it minimizes the cost function. And by doing that, you're going to end up with a low dose of rectum and high dose of the PTV. So this is the heart of IMRT, is the optimizer. Um, and how quickly it goes down, like I said, depends on the, the level of, of uh, sophistication of the optimizer. So um, let's see. Um, So this can go over many, many times. I mean, XCO usually has a limit of 100. You stop it after 100 iterations. Eclipse, it, it'll go on. It'll go on forever if you want it to. Okay. So you can set thresholds where it stops, where it stops optimizing. Um, oh yeah, I actually did this in MATLAB the other day, this weekend. I was going to give you guys an, an assignment, but since we don't have MATLAB, there, it's not fair. <laughs> but what I did in MATLAB is I calculated a grid. And I, what I use is I, I use a three-dimensional sync function. Okay, a sync function looks like, um, I don't know if you've heard of a sync function, but it's sine, it's uh, sine r, sine r over r. That's a sync function. And what I did, I made a three-dimensional sync function. And that was the original fluence. Okay, I just assume that's some crazy function that's, that's the original fluence. And then I was going to have you, and the sync function was 36 by 36 array. And I was going to have you guys do this and calculate some way of, um, and I, I told you with the PTV, I'll give you the coordinates of the PTV. And you guys had to, of course, the PTV was getting the highest dose, uh, and then I give you the coordinates of the OER. And you guys had to calculate another function that you would multiply by the same function to attenuate it where the, where the OER was. And you're going to iterate this because you might not want to, the other function that you would multiply by the sync function might be an inverse sync function. You know, and depending on how much weight you you not multiply by added, how much weight you apply to this when you add to this. If the weight is one to one, it's zero. Okay. But then if this is one and this is point one, it just reduces this a little bit. And so I was going to give you the assignment to iterate this as many times as you could till you get to, to the right level. And actually, I wrote the program. I, I, I finished it, but maybe I'll do it in another class. So flow of optimization. Assign beamlet weights. That's the first thing in that table. Okay. Calculate the dose. And I just went through this a little go, go over it one more time. This is a summary of it. Evaluate the cost function. Okay. Is it within tolerance? Did you hit your tolerance based on the table values? Yes. Then calculate the final dose. No, it's not within tolerance. Modify the beamlet weight. Calculate it again. Now, every time it's doing this, here, there's a little star here. Okay, good. The derivative of the cost function can be taken to get information from the steepness of the descent of the direction. Let me see. I think I have, yeah, I have a cost function. So uh, the optimizer takes the derivative of the cost function because you want your cost function to drop. Okay, so if your derivative is zero, it's not doing it, it's not changing. If your derivative is negative, it's dropping. If your derivative is positive, it's increasing. So the optimizer knows which way it's going. Okay. If it's going the wrong way, it's going to reverse what it did. So it uses the derivative to calculate the descent. The, and then this little start. The algorithm that is used to calculate dose between iterations is one that has been trimmed down to improve speed. This also reduces accuracy. The final dose is more accurate. Okay. So imagine 
you guys know how long it takes when you hit calculate on a shooting planning computer or calculate beams. Depending on the complexity of it, it could be 10 seconds, 20 seconds. So if it takes that long every for every iteration, you would sit there for a long time because there's hundreds of iterations. So what most treatment planning computers do is in this step here, they use a simplified um, simplified algorithm. And it's a simplified algorithm, meaning that it's not considering everything that's going on in scattering the dose calculations. So a, one example of a simplification is taking out scatter. Okay, and they just calculate primary beam. That could be done really quickly, but that could be done in under a second. Okay, so they calculate primary beam over and over. But the disadvantage of a simplified algorithm is that when you calculate your final dose, it may not look much like this dose up here. It might look a little different. Okay, and actually with XEO, you can see the two. You can see the simplified one, and then you can you can look at the DBH of the simplified one, and it might look great. You say, okay, I'm done, and then you hit final calc. And it won't look as good. Okay. So with, with um, Eclipse, you don't see the, the two. Okay, and so here's what an example of a cost function. Okay, iteration number, every time it iterates, this is in this direction, and this is the cost, you usually start high up here. And then these are called local minima. All right, so if the cost function is looking at, at the gradient, like I just said, it's looking at the derivative, saying, hey, I'm doing well, I'm going down, 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 and then it gets to zero, it says, Oops, I'm going up. I'm going to stop. Okay, guys, I'm done. This is the solution. That's a problem. Because the true, if, if, it, if it had gotten over this hump and the other humps, it might find this is the, this is the actually the ideal solution. This is a solution, too, but this is a better solution. This solution here guarantees that your rectum is getting uh, the low dose you want to give it. It guarantees that your PTB is getting the coverage you want to give it. These are not ideal. So the smart, the smart optimizers are the ones that are going to bust through these little humps here. And they're going to say, well, let's just see what happens if I keep going. Even though my derivative is positive, uh, let's just see what happens if I keep going. OK, it gets to a constant. Oh, OK, I have hit zero here. Oh, I'm doing better. Great. And then it gets this. And then it's got to climb this one. This one's a tough one to climb to ultimately achieve that. Okay. So simple algorithms will stop here, not so good ones. And then the really smart ones will stop here. The smartest one is um, simulated annealing. That's one of the one of the smarter ones, I should say, because a lot has happened over the over the past years in terms of optimizing. So simulated annealing is the type of algorithm that will that will bust through these little humps and will eventually find the global max. Neither XEO nor Eclipse use simulated annealing. I think Pinnacle uses simulated annealing. Okay. Uh, so um, XEO uses a very simple gradient descent form. What about as the iteration number goes up? Yeah. How the cost function is going down past what you call the global minimum? Yeah. How do you know this is the global or local? Because when you keep going on, there might be some. It could be more. Yeah. yeah so I mean, like at the very right hand corner of the graph, it's lower than the global minimum. Well, I shouldn't have drawn it that. I guess I shouldn't have drawn it that. Yeah, shoot. That's, no, that's a mistake on my part. That shouldn't be cool. This shouldn't say global. This should trail off like this. You're right. Because then this this would be global. Yeah, that's absolutely. Like way lower. Yeah. yeah. I think I was just trying to get the curve done. That's not an extension. I think I was just trying to get the curve done. Do you need to set our, like, endpoints and point points? Yeah, you can set endpoints. You can set endpoints and iteration numbers. Or you can set endpoints also of differences between the cost function. And this is how the, the, you can do this in XEO. So say um, say the cost function is trailing off like this, and the difference between the this iteration and the next iteration is I don't know, 0.01. You can set a threshold that if that difference is uh, less than 0.01, stop, because it's not changing anymore. Okay. So you can do that with XEO or with Eclipse. Uh, Eclipse. I don't know if you can actually set it with Eclipse. You, with Eclipse, you see it's visual. You'll see the cost function. It starts high, and it drops down, and uh, you'll see it drop down and level off. And then with Eclipse, it's cool because you can change on the fly. You can change your constraints on the fly. So you can say, OK, now I want better coverage. So you increase the coverage of the PD, and you can see your cost function go shoot up, shoot up again, and then it starts coming down again. So that interactive ability doesn't exist in XEO. It does, but it's not as sophisticated as it is in, in Eclipse. Okay. 
Okay, and then these are just some DVH comparisons between like a rectum or the IMRT versus 3D. Okay, so the rectum, you want a, you want a low rectal dose. So this is what an IMRT rectal DVH looks, and that's what a rectal uh, DVH looks for 3D conformal. Okay, it just shows an improvement. Um, intensity patterns, let's see. <clears throat> okay, so then this is the next step. After, you've, after the optimizer is done, it determines the ideal, the ideal fluence, and then the next step is the MLC patterns have to be, have to be calculated. The deliverable intensity patterns may be different due to high dose spikes or unreasonable MLC speeds. Okay, what that means is that the optimizer has calculated an ideal fluence, but can your MLC actually deliver that? I mean, for example, say the fluence. I'm going to draw. Um, I'm going to draw a profile through the ideal fluence. Okay, uh, here's the profile. So we want no dose here, but then over here we want a full dose. Can your MLC actually move fast enough to deliver this sharp gradient? That's the question. Okay, can it do it? So, um, so what happens is that after the ideal fluence is calculated, then the treatment planning computer does the full calc with the limitations of the MLC built in. And then it gives you the deliverable fluence. And, and I believe with, with Eclipse you can see the ideal and deliverable. Hopefully they're not too different. The other thing that it does, be, the, there's other differences be, 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 besides the um, MLC leaf speed. There is also uh, MLC transmission. That's not included in the ideal fluence, but it is in the deliverable. So then includes the MLC transmission in there. So that changes things too. MLC and it doesn't include interleaf and, and intraleaf. It just has one MLC transmission. The other thing it, it includes is the RFO, radiation fuel offset. Um, what else? And I believe that the new Eclipse algorithm also includes scatter off the of leaf tips. Okay, so the leaf tips have some scatter contribution. It includes that in the ideal one. And then there's also this thing called tongue and groove effect. I'm giving you guys a lot of detail. <laughs> tongue and groove effect uh, that occurs, uh, which which ends up looking, if you shoot a film, it ends up looking that you start to see these dark lines. Right? If you shoot a film of an intensity pattern or something like that, you start to see these dark lines um, between where the leaves intersect. And that's where this leaf, the, the, the groove of this, the tongue of this leaf overlaps the tongue of the other leaf. Remember what the tongue and groove was on an MLC? So the side view of an MLC looks like this. Okay, that's one MLC. And the other MLC fits inside of this. Okay, they fit inside, and that's to reduce the transmission between the leaves. Okay, the, the source is here, and the radiation is coming down this way. So the tongue and groove effect is when this tongue here, the, the shadow of this tongue here, overlaps the shadow. Uh, there's another leaf that coming in this direction, and both of those tongues add up. Okay, and then it creates a, a dark spot, it creates a low uh, a spot of low dose. And the, the more sophisticated MLC leaf sequencing algorithms can take that out and they can avoid those situations because you don't want a tongue here and a tongue here because it will create that dark line. Okay, so that's another thing that is taken into account in the deliverable fluence. Okay. okay, this is just a pretty picture. <laughs> okay, QA. So we've got QA. These, this dynamic MLC, right? We've got to make sure it's moving correctly and move to the right spots. Have you guys heard of the picket fence test? Okay, the, picket, the way the picket fence test does, it, what it does is it, it uh, moves all the leaves together, and it's a way of testing the position of the leaf tips to make sure they're going to the right spot. And the way you get this pattern is, okay, you can kind of see the leaves here. The way you get the pattern is all the leaves in one bank move to a certain spot, and then you shoot, uh, you shoot some MUs and there's some film underneath it. Then they move to another spot, shoot more MUs, move to another spot, move to another spot, move to, da, 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 and then the other bank moves. The other bank moves to the same spot. This bank moves to this spot, this bank moves to this spot, this bank moves to this spot, and the other bank is open, by the way, the other side is open. And so after that, you get this distribution of, of lines where the leaves would have, if they were touching, they would have touched. And so the ideal, the idea behind the, the picket fence test is you want to see a straight line across. If the lines are crooked, it means that the leaves aren't going to the right spot. 
So this is a very common, this is what, what most people do for MLCQA. Uh, Patient-specific IMRTQA, um, let's see, you guys know, okay, you guys probably know all this stuff. You've all done it, right? You've all done IMRTQA? Yeah? Donna, you done MRTQA? Yeah. Okay. Not with uh, now we, we use the multi cube. Uh, multi cube. Matrix multi cube. Oh yeah, okay. Okay, so you, you have an idea of what that's about. Um and then here this this slide here is from that one of those documents that I presented at the beginning. Uh, this slide is where they went out and they surveyed uh, a group surveyed many clinics around the country. And they said, give us your IMRT QA results. We want to we collect them in the document. And um, so these are just some results. So it looks like, this is just the take home message here. Look at prostate. This is the passing rate. You guys know what passing rate is in IMRT QA? 91, 95, 98% passing rate, which means it's the number of diodes on the map check that passed your requirements. So just the take home message is that prostate passed pretty high, 98%, and head and neck. Um, the head and neck plans don't pass as, as well as prostate. Okay, and then the C shape, they also had a structure that's a C shape where you're trying to treat the PTV and avoid the central structure. And that even that was even harder. Okay, the passing rate wasn't low. So basically, you take a message with this, with this paper is that as, as things get more complicated, uh, the passing rate's not as high. Now, that could, that could point to a lot of things. It could point to um, the beam data is not that not as correct. It could point to MLC is not being able to deliver it. It could point to the device that you're measuring not being accurate enough. It could be a lot. There could be a lot of reasons for this. But anyway, take-home message is that more complicated plants, such as head and neck, don't pass with the highest with a, as high a frequency as prostate. And also, it's a good place for clinical physicists to go to to get an idea of what passing rate should be. I mean, say your clinical physicist is working in a in the forest, in some clinic in the forest, and there's nobody around you, and you don't talk to anybody, and you think 80% passing rate's great because whenever you got 80% in your exam, it was good. But 80% is actually kind of crap if you look at this data. Okay, so it's a place where physicists can go and say, well, hmm, I should be getting you know 97% on my head and neck, so I'm getting 92. Okay, why is that? So it's a, it's a, just a reference. Okay, and then what do these comparison parameters mean on the when you're doing IMRT QA. Uh, so the, the, on the map check device itself, it comes with software. And after you deliver your plan, you get the results. And the results are in the form of the dose percent difference and in distance to agreement. Those are the standardized, there's many results you can, you can look at, but those are the standard results that most people look at. And so the dose percent difference is the dose measured from a map check divided, um, sorry, minus the dose planned divided by the dose measured times 100%. And it does that formula for every diet on a map check. Okay. Um, and, then, and then distance to agreement is the distance between dose gradient lines used in areas where there are gradients. Now, say this is a profile across the distribution, okay, and that's the eclipse profile. And here's what I measure with MapCheck. Of course, MapCheck are dots, right? I'm not going to get a continuous. And usually, um, and usually you'll see circles on the MapCheck screen, and it looks like that. All right, so something doesn't agree there. But if I was to apply this <coughs> this requirement, and say my say I was to apply this and see if it passed or failed, and usually the requirement for this is typically people use three percent as a tolerance value for that pass. So if I look at this and I say, okay, at this point here I'm getting 80%, this is 100 at the top, and I'm getting I'm getting 80% from app check, and I'm getting 95 from Eclipse. Well, there's a difference of 15%, fail, right? But but in areas of gradient, that could be that could be um uh, that error is exaggerated. Okay, so in areas of gradient, the most software like map check or RIT they use something called a distance to agreement. So instead of applying this this uh, requirement, they apply this requirement to areas of gradient. And then what they do instead of instead of subtracting the, the dose, they look at the distance between this point and this point. And they look at that, and then that is typically three millimeters. Just a, that's what most people use, three millimeters. 
So if you look at this, this might fall within three kilometers. Okay. So then that that little guy will pass. So map check decides where the gradients are, and it decides which test to apply to each point. Okay. So it's unfair to apply this test to this point, so it's not going to apply to that test. But it is going to apply it to this point. And so that's what it does. So it applies different tests to the different points, and then it comes up with a percent pass. Now the gamma factor is, and a gamma factor goes from 0 to 1, to 1.0, and um, the gamma factor is a combination of both of these. The percent passing grade with tolerances of A and B, given in, in this is three percent, three millimeters, with passing rate of ninety-five percent. So this is the typical, this is the typical passing rate, ninety-five percent. I would say that's more for head and neck. For prostate, I expect ninety-eight to one hundred. Okay. And then dose threshold is another parameter you'll see in the map check. And what dose threshold does is you tell map check, I don't want to look at any points. See, because there's points here too. There's points along here. I don't want to look at any points that are less than say 10% of the dose. Because at these low values, errors are multiplied. And it's all background scatter anyway. Okay, you might not be that concerned about, about these low values down here. You're more concerned about your treatment area. Okay, so you set a dose special, you say I only want to look at the points above 10%. Okay, and then this is just a screenshot from an old um, RIT um, uh, comparison between film. This is when we were using film to do MRT QA. So we would radiate. This is a beam's eye view of, uh, of an intensity pattern. And so we'd shoot the film. We'd scan it with a scanner, bring it into RIT. RIT is an image processing software that's used for QA. And then we'd export the treatment plan from our planning system. And these little points here are anchor points. So we play anchor points so that it would be able to align this to this. And then after that, then we do the subtraction and evaluation. Okay, we're going to stop there because that's a lot. A lot of stuff today. Sorry, I know I've probably drove you guys crazy. Because <coughs> there's so many, there's so many uh, topics jumping around from one subject to another. Any discussion, questions, complaints? <clears throat>